Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Today I have a guest on the program. He's new to the show, and I've been looking to get him on for quite some time. I think he does some very interesting work and some work that I've been paying attention to. His name is John Newell, and he is Vancouver-based portfolio manager of the Field House Global Precious Metals Fund. John, welcome to the program. Hi, Colin. Nice to be on your show. Well, we just spoke for some time. I almost wish that I had simply recorded our conversation because it it did a great job of going over everything that you're working on. Uh, I'll paraphrase a bit about your background. Uh, You've been in the business for 38 years, and you were previously a stockbroker at Richardson Securities, started getting very interested in the resource space back uh, at a very fortuitous time, which was 2001, 2002. And you found that the uh, business that you existed in uh, did not like to be told that uh, buy gold and sell everything else. So you slowly managed your way out of that uh, setting and you're now independent on your own and um, running a very interesting, uh, I guess we'll call it analysis uh, that you use to pick stocks. And that's what I want to dive into uh, today. I'll also mention uh, that, John, your fund is a holder of Triumph Gold Corp., which uh, Palisade Global uh, proudly owns about 18.5% of at this point. And uh, that's something that we're going to discuss a bit today. So, uh, John, did I miss anything there? And if not, uh, maybe you can dive into uh, your relative strength technical analysis that you use. Yeah, yeah, I think that sort of covers it. The easiest way to describe it, but it's much more than relative strength, is that relative strength brings the the cream to the top, so to speak. And back in 2013, when I started this proposal of a pilot precious metal fund, I noticed that Kirkland Lake, Lakeshore, Probe, Orico, Stop going down in that big fall in 2013 in, in the physical gold price. And so uh, I started noticing certain patterns and behaviors of, of, of these stocks. And so I concentrated on just those uh, companies. And basically, it's screening about really 2,000 precious metals companies through um, a filtering process. Let's call it relative strength. It's a bit more than that. And and we screen to try to find the strongest stocks in right now, which which is a, 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 a really weak sector. And currently in, the, in that group there, is, are very few companies that display a lot of strength. Just to name a few, West Dome, Corvus, Nevson, Gelradian was taken over. It was in it. Um, Kirkland Lake and maybe Oceanic Gold and Trilogy Metals to some extent also. I use a different screening process for a company like Triumph. Triumph over the last five years, built a long, pretty traditional, technical, head and shoulders bottom. And and I've been asked to do charts on it in the past, and, and I just didn't think it was ready. But then it, it formed a, what I call a cylinder. Uh, and in that cylinder, it has a trigger point. And that trigger point was 44 cents. You saw when it broke through that, 44 cent area, it really went to its first target of 70 cents, exceeded it. My next targets are $1.20 and I think $2.40. I, I just forget. You have to obviously get to the first target before you get to the second one. And to, to give another example, Great Bear, which had much the same kind of chart, I was asked to do a chart on it. It had targets of $64, $1.20, and $1.80. It happened 
in the last two weeks to exceed all those targets in three days and then has built another higher target. So that's sort of the, you know, drilling down on individual companies. But uh, I've also been in this business long enough to see Aurelian after its pretty good drill holes went down. And uh, Virginia, as it was building its resort at Eleanor, also went down before it went from a dollar to ten dollars. What I'm trying to say is, I'm not trying to day trade these companies. I'm looking for companies that have the ability to really move the needle for uh, bigger companies that are trying to replace a declining reserve base. And so that's sort of what I'm looking for. And I think that West Dome is doing great work. Corvus, Nevson, obviously, and Kirkland Lake are really well-run companies. So I look for the strength, and then I kind of try to find the fundamental reasons behind it. And if you look at both in the case of Triumph and Great Bear, companies had worked on them before. Companies had got good drill results in the past, but they couldn't put it together. And sometimes, you know, a property or these almost district style plays go through, you know, seven to 10 owners before they get some real joy in the drill bit and get to put a resource together. And for those companies, I mean, it's one in the statistical odds of becoming a mine uh, are probably one in a million. So you really have to you really have to look at all all the all the bosses, not just technicals, but the management team, the financial resources, the area or the jurisdiction and and infrastructure, uh, both in uh, the two companies I was just talking about, Triumph and Great Bear they're blessed with a uh, tremendous infrastructure. John, I asked you a similar question before the interview, and I'll, I'll kind of state it in a slightly different way, but there are maybe two different kinds of resource investors if you were to make two groups. And the one mentality is like the Doug Casey mentality, which is I like five cent paper because you know it's cheap now and it was at a higher price before and being that we are in a cyclical market chances are at some point it will go back up and since it's come down so much there's a a lot of elasticity and then you know somebody looking more at a technical analysis side and for relative strength uh, is looking for something where the cream as you said has already started to rise and by the time you're screening catches that, that means that that cream has already risen at least a bit. And one would think that that almost makes it a little bit more expensive um, and hence riskier. So my question to you is, you know, what is it in your method that, um, you know, you like to focus on things that have already moved up a bit? What is it telling you? Okay. So yeah, it, it could be, um, you know, traditional technical analysis, long bases, where um, you've seen an accumulation pattern. Um, th then there are certain times when patterns have um, uh, built predictable targets. So I'm looking for a spot that um, it, it is a trigger. Um, for an explosive move um, in the in the very short term, that that can that trigger can take um it, it's not an instantaneous it, it can flutter around that trigger point for a while. I'm trying to filter stock charts that look like they're ready to go at this moment in time. Okay, let's. Let, let's look at uh, Triumph Gold as an example. There are a lot of eyes on that right now, particularly from people who will listen to this broadcast, being that 
we talk about Triumph Gold uh, so much in the past. Uh, there's been the result of the last uh, drilling season, which just has ended, starting to come out, and uh, a discovery, or I should say confirmation of the discovery found last year in this blue sky, gold-rich copper porphyry system. The stock is, you know, trading in this range. You showed the breakout to this level. Now we're at this level. So what does it take um, to kind of trigger that move up to the, the next level? And what do you kind of expect that's going to happen? If you go back to the beginning of Northern Free Gold before it was Triumph Gold, there are a whole team of people working to build a resource in an area that they believe is endowed with gold. And then you had 2011, 12, and you had the waterfall down and nobody could get money. And then this guy picks up the reins, John Anderson, and he starts to rebuild the company because of the belief of what they got have there. Actually, Bob Moriarty on the property smashed a, a rock and gold popped out of it. Uh, the first time I was ever on that property back in 2006. So, so there's always been a belief that there was something there that could grow. And then you went through this long base building period of, gosh, five years, where some time ago, the fundamentals, they started to get some joy in the drill bit uh, and started to you know, get funding from you guys, Gold Corp, etc. And they started building on the strength of all those years ago, but adding to it and adding to it. And then in that chart pattern, it, there's a built-in, uh, I call it a cylinder. And I know it sounds woo-woo stuff, but, but an invisible resistance point, that happened to be 44 and when it broke through 44, the first target was 70 cents. It hit it and exceeded it. it has kind of pulled back, hummed and hawed in this area that you spoke about, 80 to 60 or whatever. What What's going to move that stock is, is going to be the drill bit and, and what the, the, this team uh, have, have managed to put or, or are going to show us in the next 50 holes or so. And... They've proven that it's a porphyry. They've proven that it's big, that, it's, that they have economic holes. Now just we, we have to determine the size. The best way I describe a breakout is it's like um, a plane uh, going through the sound barrier. You just get that boom and the hush of no resistance. And when a stock gets that boom, like in the case of uh, Triumph or Great Bear, you just get a, there's no resistance. There's no one prepared to sell it until they fully understand what's going on. And, and that's the, the move. So we, I can't predict the future of the Triumph move, but my work suggests that there's a higher target, and obviously it's got to break the old highs. It's doing it. it it's, it's holding tough in, a, in, a, in an extremely tough environment. It, this is not an easy precious metals market to, to thrive in. It's a bit of a heartbreaker on some of the really good names, Alamos taking over Richmond, doing all the right things, buying assets on the way down, and, and uh, you know expanding their resource base gets punished for doing it in the short term, but in the long term, that's what companies are supposed to be doing. And it's just like the original Cedars of Triumph or the people that uh, back Triumph kind of like in its second life, uh, believe the project could be important. And the drill bit's really showing that. Well, John, that's a, that's a fascinating read on the Triumph story, and I'm uh, probably over here hoping and 
thinking and knowing that you're right, but I'm uh, one of the people who stands to benefit the most. So I do hope that you're right. But I've, I've been following your work for some time, and I, I find that uh, it's very insightful. So that I would um, thank you for coming on the show here and sharing that insight with the, the audience. And uh, we'll see as these holes keep coming out uh, what the story does. And, you know, we'll continue to update listeners with uh with your read hopefully we blow through that next target and then we can get you back on and discuss uh what the kind of uh system tells you at this point and where you think it can go from here so john thank you very much for coming on the program and talking to us today all right well thank you very much colin that was a lot of fun think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?